Hello and welcome to Global News Today, bringing you exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers every weekday right here on Al Arabiya News. I'm Tom Burgess Watson, coming up on the programme. A week before election day, across all seven battleground states, the candidates are within just two points of each other, making each state a toss-up. The former President Donald Trump heads to Allentown, Pennsylvania. That's a key battleground state as he brushes off critics, including the former First Lady Michelle Obama. Kamala Harris rallies in Washington in what her team is calling the former prosecutor's closing argument. And Israel's parliament votes to ban the UN's Palestinian refugee agency from operating in Israel and occupied East Jerusalem, alleging its collusion with Hamas. Hello and welcome. The U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is set to address a crowd of 20,000 people in Washington tonight. Her team is framing this as the former prosecutor's closing argument where well, she will speak at the Ellipse, which is just outside the White House, an area that previously hosted Donald Trump's rally on the 6th of January 2021, shortly before the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Meanwhile, Tim Waltz, Harris's running mate, will campaign in Georgia. That is a crucial swing state where Trump has been actively rallying his supporters. Well, Trump spoke from his home in Mar-a-Lago in Florida before heading to Allentown, Pennsylvania today. Pennsylvania, of course, a key battleground state where both he and Harris have made several recent visits. Well, given the significant Puerto Rican population in Pennsylvania and the racist remark made at Trump's rally regarding the U.S. territory, these campaign stops could prove critical to his efforts in the state where he currently holds a narrow lead, according, according to poll trackers. Well, I'm joined now by the Republican strategist and former chairman of the Nevada State Republican Party, Amy Tarkanian. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Al Arabiya News, Amy. Um, I just want to start by asking about your own uh, story, because uh, back in 2016, you were a delegate for Donald Trump. I gather you voted for him in 2020, but this time you're not going to support him. Why the change of heart? That is correct, and I actually learned the hard way. Um, I actually chose a couple of other uh, possible candidates in 2016 before I fell in line and became a delegate for Donald Trump. So he wasn't ever my first choice, but uh, I did feel that he was better than the Democrat opponent. And so uh, we continued down that road leading into 2020. I thought he was doing a fairly decent job at turning the economy around and leading the nation and where it needed to head. And uh, towards the end of um, his, his time in office, it became extremely disappointing and concerning uh, because he continued to surround himself with grifters, um, with people who were now in trouble with uh, the justice system, and he was continuing to put uh, misinformation, and quite honestly, that's that's uh, an accident, but disinformation is intentional. So he was also now starting to peddle disinformation uh, leading up to the possibility of him losing the election. And so instead of having any self-reflection, he pointed the blame on everyone else and everything else. And uh, that led his base to believe that there was systemic fraud, which I, I think really harmed our uh, election system uh, tremendously. And not only that, but... The final straw for me was the January 6th uh, insurrection at the Capitol, where he sat idly by for several hours and allowed people to continue to create chaos. Um, some were peaceful, that is correct, but there were many that were not. And uh, there were some that were injured, many that were um, hurt, and are still now having to deal with the repercussions and are in prison because they believed every word that he said about storming the Capitol and that he would be by their side. So I, I think his rhetoric is quite dangerous, and I've had enough. Do you think your case is unusual, or do you think there are a lot of people like you who perhaps voted for Trump in the past but won't vote for him ever again? 
I do believe that there is a voting segment that uh, feel the same that I do. Are they quite as vocal? No. I think that you have a number of people, especially when President Biden was still the presumptive nominee, and they were deemed what we now call double haters. And I still fit that bill. I'm not happy with uh, either the Democrat or Republican um, options at the top of the ticket. And so that's why you also see in my home state of Nevada, um, an increase in the party registrations of nonpartisan and independents. Um, it's skyrocketed, in fact. And then in second place would be Democrat and in third, Republican. Um, back in July, you're quoted as having described the electoral campaign as the script from a scary movie. And I'm just wondering, uh, in the three months that have passed since you made that comment, where do you think the script has got a whole lot scarier? I do. And it's interesting because you see polling across the nation. And of course, you can take polling seriously or you can take polling with a grain of salt because it's just a snapshot. And quite honestly, I have seen time and time again, polls fail miserably. But it does seem that no matter the polling company, uh, they do have the, this election in a nail biter. It's, it's neck and neck. Um, and I think it's because, you know, thankfully for Donald Trump's sake, um, he is now running against Kamala Harris, who is viewed as somebody who is extremely weak and a puppet and doesn't really um, have her research down on the issues um, as well as she should. And then you've got now Donald Trump who unfortunately yesterday, I think, um, displayed something disgusting and terrible um, where he had a number of speakers for several hours um, leading up to his speech at a rally in New York um, with disgusting, which would were supposed to be jokes, but they weren't funny. This wasn't an award ceremony. It's not a roasting ceremony. It's not a fundraiser. This is where you're supposed to be serious and, and talk about where you're going to take the nation and talk about issues. But yet they chose to, uh, you know, basically uh, use bigotry, hate, vileness, um, and, and a, continue to attack Vice President Harris on, you know, her ethnicity. Um, it was It was quite disgusting. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting listening to some of what was said yesterday, because from a purely strategic point of view, and this is your uh, area of expertise, I mean, it's quite risky um, making mm -hmm. jokes or poking fun at quite large uh, segments of the uh, electoral population. I mean, uh, he was making jokes uh, about uh, obviously alluding to that comment from a former staffer who, who, who said he had fascist tendencies. And then he made a joke about these uh, German generals and how he wished he'd had a few of them. I mean, that's going to horrify some elements of the electorate, isn't it? And could cost him uh, quite dearly. I mean, do you think that's an act of self-harm? I do, and I also think it's an act of arrogance. I, I think it was very sloppy, and I don't think it was smart strategically at all. Of course, it's great to be able to sit there and to um, crack jokes about certain scenarios, but this is not stand-up comedy hour. This is not a time where you're supposed to be poking fun at a certain segment of people or, or situations that are unfortunate, and that's exactly what they did. It was it was poor taste and timing, and I think it will end up hurting him uh, to some degree. Uh, you know, he's going to be heading now towards Pennsylvania, um, and rightfully so. Hopefully, he's able to clean up some of the mess that was made because there is a very large Puerto Rican voting base there. And I'm currently right now I'm in the state of Florida, which also has a very large Puerto Rican voting base. And that was one of the distasteful, disgusting jokes that was made on that stage, basically saying that Puerto Rico was an island you know, of garbage. And, and so that's not funny. <laughs> it might it might work might work in in a small uh, you know comedy room so, somewhere else, but this is a very large. This is not just national; it's international stage, and people are watching and they're listening and they're they're wanting to know where are you going to take us? How are you going to help me and my family? And that was not helpful. Yeah, I mean Pennsylvania has a really important and growing. Latino electorate, uh, voter population. I mean, I, I read that uh, the numbers of people of Latino heritage in Pennsylvania have tripled since the year 2000. We're now talking about 620,000 people in Pennsylvania who uh, have uh, Latino heritage. I mean, import, such an important state like Pennsylvania. I mean, 620,000 people upset, offended, uh, maybe not all of them, but some of them. I mean, that's the sort of thing that could actually switch the 
the, 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 the state altogether, isn't it? I mean, that could really end up costing him uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Sure, 100 percent, because I, I honestly do believe that you do have a number of people out there, such as I described, that are double haters or people that are undecided still. And that very well could have been the, the final straw. That could have been, you know, maybe they were teetering and now it's time to go into in the ballot box and they're just simply going to flip that switch last second. There are voters like that. So, you know, I, once again, it was not wise. I, I think this was terrible. And the fact that you also had um, leaders from states such as Florida, um, Pennsylvania, that were quick in response to uh, this, these negative words being spoken, uh, took to social media and, and basically, um, you know, said th th this is not acceptable. This is not a reflection of who we are. I do not agree with these comments. And uh, but where was Donald Trump? You know, he he didn't he didn't respond right away. He didn't even respond. Um, when he took to the stage, um, he just let things continue to flow in, in the way that it did, unfortunately. And then once the comments went viral, then they issued a statement. Yeah, he issued a statement, but it wasn't a personal apology, was it? Correct. Correct. Um, so those Tony Hinchcliffe comments, I mean, have caused a, a massive furor. And, and in fact, we've talked, uh, you know, about this today and yesterday here at Al Arabian News quite extensively. And I'm, I'm just wondering, are there any signs this is dying down? Are they dying down? No, no is the, I is, is the furor dying down? No, I think it's ramping up. I think uh, the fact that yesterday, you know, I didn't catch the entire rally uh, the night prior. Uh, and I woke up yesterday to, um, you know, clips of it and was mortified. And I, I had a number of people call me um, actually mortified as well. And so, you know, I, I think the, con the conversation is still going on. Um, you know, two days later, and we're waiting now to see, uh, is Donald Trump going to apologize today in his pre press conference that he's supposed to be holding? And then uh, this evening, uh, Kamala Harris is also supposed to be addressing the nation in the very same um, area where Donald Trump addressed the nation on January 6th. So today is going to be quite a, quite an interesting day. But you have to hand it to Donald Trump that uh, he's been outspent three to one by the Harris campaign, and yet, according to the polls, the two candidates are neck and neck. So clearly, with a lot less money, he's manning, mm -hmm. managing to deliver a much better return on investment to those who've, uh, who've, who've, who've contributed to his campaign. Mm -hmm. Clearly, his messages are still chiming with a huge section of the US population. Once again, I don't think necessarily it's because he's the answer. I think it's because you look at the the other option. When you had President Biden, everybody knew, everyone who was being honest with themselves knew that there was something cognitively wrong. And that's just something that unfortunately comes with age with many people. And so people did not feel confident or comfortable with moving forward with him. And then once they replaced him with Kamala Harris, she may you know, come off as somebody who's joyful, she loves to use that word, as somebody who's positive and ready to move forward, but the problem is, is she also comes across as somebody who is known for having a word salad, who doesn't sit down and do her research, and who comes across as extremely weak puppet. And so it, that all works in his favor. It's not that he's necessarily the answer. But from a, an economic point of view, and, and the economy is time and time again the top issue on voters' minds. I mean, people, people have fond memories of the Trump years, notably mm -hmm. Uh, with regards to his his record on on the economy and the, and 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 the employment rate and everything else, do they not? They do, but we also have short-term memories. I mean, we're now in a, a day and age where you've got thirty-second blurbs, you've got you know X on posts that people follow, and uh, you've got short attention spans more so than ever. So you know that's that's an area where I think the Trump campaign has failed miserably. Is they should have just been repeating that message over and over and over and, and just banging it into our heads, um, reminding us about the good that, that actually ensued under a Trump administration and how they were going to pick up the pieces and, and move forward with that game plan and um, actually make it even more so uh, positive. But instead, we keep hearing about, you know, Haitian immigrants eating cats and dogs or the fact that Puerto Rico is now, you know, a garbage island. I mean, it just it gets completely 
uh, dissolved. The message gets completely dissolved by these inane comments. I know foreign policy isn't high up the list of voter concerns, but some people internationally view the Trump presidency as, uh, uh, you know, they, there were no wars during the Trump presidency. And uh, there's a lot of optimism that if mm -hmm. Donald Trump does win a second term of office, he'll be able to put a stop to uh, quite a lot of the conflicts that have broken out in the last few years. I mean, what, what, what do you think about that? Well, that's what he says. And so, you know, if he is reelected, I sure hope that's the truth, um, because I, I know that you have a lot of people, um, no matter what your party affiliation, they are very concerned about what's going on around the world and how it does affect us here at home and our loved ones who happen to live in those parts of the world. So, uh, you know, I, I think that um, having us return to that era of peace would be phenomenal. But he, uh, you know, makes a lot of promises. Um, and so, you know, it, it will be interesting to see exactly um, what kind of relationships he has now with some of the new leaders that are across the pond, so to speak, um, that maybe weren't in those positions at that time when he was president. Okay, well, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. We're out of time now. Amy Tarkanian, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Well, for more, I'm joined now by the former speechwriter to former President Barack Obama and the best-selling author David Litt. David, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us. Um, we heard from your former boss, Barack Obama, on Monday. He said, reject the politics of division and hatred. And just looking at this election from the outside in, I mean, we're hearing a lot of extreme rhetoric being used. And just first of all, tell us, is it always like this? Or is the 2024 campaign uh, rather unusual in this respect? Well, I think in many ways, ever since Donald Trump began running for president, we have experienced levels of division, and as President Obama said, hatred, that we just have not before uh, in our politics, certainly in my lifetime. So in that sense, unfortunately, this has become the kind of exhausting new normal, and it's why I think a lot of voters, even some voters who are going to vote for Trump, are really sick of his antics. Um, at the same time, I think the 2024 campaign has been different. Trump clearly feels that after January 6th, after being uh, criminally convicted and you know his campaign still moving forward, he has permission to say and do things that even 2020 Trump or 2016 Trump would have said are unhinged. And I think that's something we saw at this rally at Madison Square Garden on Sunday, but we've frankly seen it all through this campaign. So I, I think this is an escalation right, of what we've already seen from Donald Trump, and it's dividing an already divided country even further. Yeah, I was going to ask you about uh, Madison Square Garden and the, uh, the whole uh, Puerto Rico furor. I mean, that was all the result of a, of a joke cracked by uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, who's a comedian. And uh, you were at one point the uh, speechwriter and the scriptwriter for the White House Correspondents' uh, Dinner Speeches. So you've uh, got a good sense of humor. And I gather you're also working on a sitcom at the moment about life in uh, DC. So let me ask you this. One commentator said to us yesterday, the Democrats don't have a sense of humor and that's why they're getting so upset about that Puerto Rico comment. How do you, how do you respond to that? What I would say is uh, Tony Hinchcliffe seems like the kind of guy who goes to a funeral and says a bunch of you know insulting jokes and then says, how come you don't have a sense of humor? Like there's a time and a place. This isn't complicated. Um, I, I wrote jokes for President Obama, as you said. I've written comedy outside of, of my political work. And there are venues that make sense for this. I mean, there are certainly offensive jokes that I have enjoyed in life. I think most of us, if we're being honest, have. But the fact that the Trump campaign, we now know, by the way, vetted these remarks. They saw the remarks. They took out other stuff because they said it was too offensive. So clearly, they did think some jokes were inappropriate. And then they put him up there with a Trump Vance sign at the biggest night for the Trump campaign in Trump campaign history and said, all right, go for it. And I think that says a lot about what a second Trump presidency would look like. And it's why this is breaking through, both with Puerto Rican voters, but also with voters who say, this, you know, Donald Trump does not seem interested in solving our problems. He seems interested in this kind of parade of division. And I think that's why, you know, it, it, that, that this is um, having an impact at a moment when I think a lot of people thought, uh, that, you know, Donald Trump is Teflon, nothing breaks through. This really is. Yeah, so what you're saying is, is, is something we've been hearing quite a bit, which is that there's an element of 
shooting oneself in the foot here and that this uh, insult, as it's perceived by a lot of people of Latino heritage, um, is actually quite damaging for Donald Trump and for the Republicans, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately this campaign, like every campaign, comes down to the question of who is going to fight for you? And just generally speaking, if somebody invites someone on stage to insult you, they're probably not going to fight for you when you're president, when they're president, right? I think President Obama said something sort of similar to that. I think I'm paraphrasing him. And I think that's, um, you know, it's, is it going to turn a close election into a landslide victory for Kamala Harris? Uh, sadly, at least from my perspective, it won't. This is still going to be a very close race. But I do think that the uh, mask is coming off and that people are saying, okay, Donald Trump, Trump is not going to be some economic genius. He is focused on revenge. He's focused on his own grievances. He's focused on these weird sort of stoking divisions in order to distract us and divide us. Um, that's not a plan to deal with the stuff that I care about, that my family cares about. Right? One of the things that really struck me was the story coming out of that rally had nothing to do with how he would bring down uh, prices or deal with rising costs. Those are the biggest issues to voters. And that rally said, we don't care about that stuff. All we care about is our weird sort of, you know, hateful things. So uh, Americans of Latino and in particular Puerto Rican heritage uh, basically could, in some swing states, end up deciding the outcome of, of this selection, couldn't they? I mean, how important is the Latino vote to the chances of either candidate? The Latino vote is very important. Um, we have seen that Trump has, uh, according to polls, been making up some ground there. Um, he's still probably not going to be shocked if he beat Harris among Latinos, but he'll get come closer than I think a lot of Democrats would like. And so if this causes some Latinos to reconsider or causes others to turn out who might otherwise say, no, nah, I'm going to sit this one out, that's very important. But I just do want to say um, what happened at that rally was not merely offensive to Latinos, was not merely offensive to Puerto Ricans. Um, I, I'm, I'm neither of those categories of, of person, but as an American, I was really appalled by that. And I think you see a lot of other Americans who say the same thing. There's a lot of voters in the suburbs, right, who are independent-minded, maybe former Republicans, have been trending toward Democrats, and what they keep saying is, what Trump is doing is just too disgusting, too unacceptable for me to be comfortable with. And I think if you had any more of those suburban voters on the fence who said, maybe I can stomach a vote for this guy, the rally at Madison Square Garden is a reminder of what so many Americans are ready for to turn the page on Donald Trump. Right? We're so tired of this. Sure. Those sort of, I think it's about three to five percent, isn't it, of undecided voters at this particular stage in the race. And, and what you're saying is that these comments and this kind of rhetoric could actually swing them. Do you think it would swing them more than perhaps their position or their, their beliefs about the economy, about immigration, uh, democracy, abortion, some of the other big issues uh, that, that are usually at the forefront of voters' minds? So people are complicated. I think most people make their decision based on a variety of factors. I think what you're going to have is a lot of people who falsely, in my view, remember the Trump years fondly economically, but also remember Donald Trump and who he is, and they really don't like him. And they're trying to balance those two things out. Do I, is my fear about what Donald Trump would do if we give him another term so great that it outweighs my fond memories, whether they're accurate or not, of the first Trump term and the economy under that, um, you know, under, in Trump's first few years before COVID. Um, so, you know, it's a balancing test. And it, this was Sunday's rally was more or less like putting a giant weight on one end of the scale. Some people will still say, I'm sure, I have you know, no choice. I've got to vote for Trump. I don't agree with that, but some people will say it. I think other people will say, OK, I, I liked the economy under him, but this is too far. Right? This is just too far. And so I think in a close election, if you, know, you want to be winning votes, not losing them, I just think that's the, the most uh, obvious idea in politics. But it's one that I think the Trump campaign clearly forgot uh, at their big rally on Sunday. OK. so. We've talked quite a bit already about Latino voters and their voter intentions. Um, we've been talking quite a bit on this channel about the Arab American voters and Muslim American voters and their intentions in this election. And I think it's fair to say that the uh, war in Israel has been more damaging to uh, the Democrats than it would be for, for Donald Trump, because of course they are the party in office. I mean, would you agree with that? And just how much do you think 
the war in Gaza and the Biden administration's policy towards Israel and the situation broadly in the region. Uh, how much that's cost, do you think, um, Kamala Harris? So I'm glad you brought up Gaza, um, both because it's an important issue in the campaign, it's an important issue in the world, um, also because it was something else that came up at this rally, right? Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of, of New York City, um, and a big, you know, important Trump surrogate, said, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said Palestinians grow up to hate Americans and that tr Trump is going to keep refugees from Gaza out of this country. And he said a bunch of other nasty things. Um, I do think that Donald Trump, because he has not been in office during this war, has benefited from kind of, you know, has he's gotten the benefit of the doubt, right? I, th I think there's some group of Arab American voters who have said, you know, maybe he would be better uh, on this issue than Kamala Harris would. I think that, again, you know, I am sure that uh, that comment from Rudy Giuliani is spreading right now um, in communities where people say, wait a second, his agenda is substantially worse than Harris's. That may not mean that there's no crossover at all, right? I do think that the war in Gaza has had a real impact. Of course it has. Um, but I think that it's this kind of 11th hour moment where people are realizing, hey, wait a second, Donald Trump is not just a generic alternative. He has a plan, and his plan is extremely, um, you know, it's much more uh, in line um, with our worst case scenario than Kamala Harris's. So I, I think that these things are, um, they're happening, but they're they're not done happening, right? This election isn't, isn't over yet. And I think we're already seeing people at the last minute say, wait a second, are we really sure we wanna do this? At the beginning, when uh, Kamala Harris became the Democratic Party's nominee for uh, the, the race for the White House, people felt they didn't really know all that much about her. There was a sense, who is this uh, woman uh, who's been vice president for these last nearly four years uh, that we haven't heard a huge amount from? Do you think that's a fair perception? And do you think that that perception has changed during these last three months that she's been on the campaign trail and that people now do feel at last they do know a bit more about her? Yeah, I think that they absolutely do know substantially more about her. And more importantly, for the, the Harris campaign's perspective, the more voters have gotten to know her, the more they like her. Um, that said, voters who ultimately will matter the most in this election because they haven't made up their minds are often the ones who follow politics least closely. So many undecided voters or potentially undecided voters are the same group of voters who said, I never really heard of Kamala Harris before this. So then the question becomes, how has she, the perception of her changed over the last few months when she's been the nominee? Her favorable ratings have gone way up. Um, that's pretty unprecedented. Um, most important, her attributes, you know, in, in polling, they would say like uh, attribute questions are, strong, are, is she a strong leader? Does she fight for people like me? Um, especially that last one is really important. And we've seen those numbers climbing and climbing and climbing. So this is going to be a close election. I'm not suggesting it isn't, but those were th sort of uh, necessary conditions for a Harris victory. And I think those conditions have been met. And now the question for Harris is, can she get over the top, right? Can she convince people that she's ready to be president and that she is going to make their lives better. I think she's convinced a lot of people, but if she can convince just a few more, this goes from a sort of 50-50 race to something that the Harris campaign would feel pretty comfortable about. Yeah, maybe some of those undecided uh, voters will be listening tonight because Kamala Harris is going to make an important speech tonight, isn't she? And she's chosen uh, a really symbolic location for it in uh, DC. Um, what sort of things do you think we should be listening out for in this so-called closing argument speech tonight? Well, you mentioned the location, and she's she's going to be in Washington, D.C., but more than that, she's going to be on the ellipse, which is where Donald Trump gave his speech telling his supporters to storm the Capitol. And I don't know if she's going to bring that up or not, but the contrast, just visually and the message it's sending is very clear. I think the idea she wants voters to imagine, do we want President Harris or do we want President Trump? This is what President Harris would look like and do. This is what President Trump looked like and did when he actually had the power that he now seeks again. And I imagine, without knowing anything exactly about what she'll say in the speech, it, she's going to really focus on um, the next four years, right? And, and most importantly, and this is something I think she's done well, she's going to focus on what it means for voters, what it means for the American people, what it means for you and your family. Because I think that's a big thing that Trump is, is failing to do, right? I mean, he has not had a lot of detailed plans 
about how to help people. He spends a lot of time talking about himself. And I think if Harris can convince people, all right, I don't, you know, I haven't known her for decades, like I've known Donald Trump, but she seems like her heart is in the right place. She's fighting for me. She laid out some ideas that I like. Um, you know, no, no candidate is going to cross the threshold of, I'm 100% sure they've satisfied every single concern. That just never happens in politics. But if you can get people to a place where they trust you, then they're, they're going to vote for you. Um, some people have criticized uh, Kamala Harris for focusing too much, and this is coming from people who actually support her as well, um, for calling out Donald Trump's inflammatory comments a bit too often. Do you think that's something she's done too often and perhaps not spent enough time focusing on her own vision and more time or more time than she should have done focusing on or responding to inflammatory comments, which have ultimately uh, gone on to serve Donald Trump better than her? Well, let me start by saying, as a political communications person, right, I've been, I've been doing this for a while, the first question I always ask is not, what should we say? It's, what's the truth? And the truth is that Donald Trump is extraordinarily dangerous. And it's not just his inflammatory comments. It's what he says he will do if he gets the kind of power that he wants without the guardrails that existed in the last term, right, just to go through a couple of them. He wants to use the military to persecute his political enemies. He said this publicly many, many times. He wants to round up undocumented immigrants, including people not just who crossed the border recently, but have lived here for decades and put them in militarized camps using a law from 1798. Um, he wants to ban abortion. Not, he, he says he won't sign a national ban, but he could use another law from more than 100 years ago called the Comstock Act to effectively ban abortion nationwide. And so all of these things and many, many more are genuinely really, really frightening and dangerous, not to mention the fact that he doesn't respect elections and democracy. So yes, Kamala Harris absolutely should be saying that because it's true and because voters care about it. But she's doing something else which I think is very important. She's also saying this is going to affect your life. It's not just an ideological or intellectual exercise that we need to protect democracy or that Donald Trump is you know, a vulgar bad guy. Um, it's that he is laser focused on his enemies list, as she's put it, where she's saying, I'm focused on my to do list. I think that was a really smart rhetorical contrast, because what she's basically saying is Trump's obsession with stuff about re revenge and, you know, uh, using the military to go after Americans. Not only is that very bad from a moral perspective, even more than that, it's taking the eye off the off the ball when it comes to the stuff that matters to you. And I think if she can make that case, she can sort of both do two things at once. And when you do two things at once in politics, it's difficult, but it tends to be effective. Yeah, and in fact, uh, Donald Trump, one of the things he said in the last, I think it was on ye uh, yesterday in one of his speeches, he said that Michelle Obama uh, had made a big mistake, quote unquote, for being nasty to him uh, in a recent speech. And I wonder what, uh, it's, it does sound rather threatening, doesn't it? That kind of language saying you've made a big mistake. Uh, I mean, w w what's he getting at here? You know, it's fascinating to me that you're right. That does sound threatening. It's probably one of the, the it wouldn't make the top 100 list of most threatening things that Donald Trump has said, right? I mean, he, when you're talking about using the military to go after the Americans who oppose you, um, you know, calling someone nasty is, is doesn't even rate, which is sh shocking. And, and it goes back to some, what we were talking about at the very beginning of this conversation. This is not how politics used to be. I would also point out, I don't think Donald Trump has met a woman yet who disagrees with him, who he has not called nasty. So that's not really yeah, but it was But it was more about, the, I, was more about the, the big mistake aspect of the comment that struck me, because it sounds like there's a, yeah. there's a threat behind that. Well, it sounds like, you know, I, I think, um, my general rule, because uh, I'm one of I like uh, you know true crime books about the mafia and organized crime. Every book I've ever read about organized crime families is a book about Donald Trump and the way that he sees power. And it's somewhat similar to you know if you're a organized crime boss and you say I don't know that seems like a problem for you right you know you're saying something without saying it. And Trump loves to talk in those sort of undertones right. He's telling his supporters these are bad people. But he's not specifically ordering them to do something illegal or, um, you know, something that he had, can put his hands on. And I think that is true. I mean, I think people are just so tired of that kind of bullying language. Now, Michelle Obama, I think, is, you know, she's tough enough to take it. Um, but I also think, by the way, it's a sign that what Michelle Obama said, where she, I think he was talking about her 
describing what life would look like for women under a Trump administration and really imploring men who care about women, which is most men, to think about that when they cast their votes, um, it, it's a sign that it clearly got under his skin and that he's worried that it's having an impact. OK, well, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm told we're out of time, but it's been great speaking to you. Uh, David Litt, former speechwriter and a best-selling author. Thank you very much, Indy. Thanks for having me. There are seven pivotal swing states, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Michigan, Arizona, Wisconsin and Nevada. They are poised to determine the outcome of this election, prompting both campaigns to concentrate their efforts there. Well, as reported by 538's daily poll tracker, Harris has a slim lead in Michigan. Trump has a slight advantage over Harris in Pennsylvania and Nevada, along with a more significant lead in North Carolina, Arizona and Georgia. Well, in Wisconsin, the race is incredibly tight, with less than a tenth of a percentage point separating the two candidates. Well, across all seven states, the candidates are within two points of each other. That's well within the poll's margin of error, making each state a toss-up. This, of course, just days before the election. Well, for more, I'm joined now by the Republican pollster and president and CEO of the Tarrants Group, BJ Martino. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to Al Arabia News. Um, it's an incredibly tight looking election at this particular moment. So I just want to start by asking you how you've seen the polls evolving during the course of the last couple of weeks. Well, the last couple of weeks relative to all of the events of this election cycle have been relatively consistent, although certainly showing uh, an increasing level of intensity and support for the Trump campaign. You've seen, obviously, going back to June when President Biden was still on the ballot, the advantages that Trump had, that all the world turned upside down when uh, Kamala Harris became the nominee. And we all agreed in the polling community and many others that it would take some time for the fundamentals of this race to come back to normal. And I think we've we've really seen that now, where although each of the critical states in this election are incredibly close, there does seem to be a little bit of that momentum late for Trump. I mean, obviously, this is the top news story, not just in the US, but in many countries around the world, the US election capturing uh, the headlines everywhere. Um, and I'm just wondering whether this keen interest in the election is going to translate, in your opinion, into voter participation, because we're seeing about 40 million people casting their ballots early so far. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? We're looking at a high turnout here. I think we are looking at a high turnout. There were a lot of uh, models and suggestions that turnout in this election would be something lower than we saw in 2020. But to your point, the absentee and early voting that we've seen in a lot of states suggests that there is some of those voters who have perhaps only voted in one presidential or have not voted in a presidential election in their lifetime uh, who are coming to the polls and casting ballots early. So I would not be surprised ultimately if we see something commensurate with the 2020 turnout, which was quite high for our country. And then we've got these undecided voters between 3 and 5%. Or maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong on that stats, but perhaps you have a, a better and more accurate statistic. But I've been reading somewhere between 3 and 5% of voters are undecided. What do you think is likely to swing them at the late, at the late stage? I honestly don't think at this point in the election there is many, if any, voters who are truly undecided in this race. Perhaps they're unwilling to tell a pollster or they're not asked in the right way to make sure to reveal that preference. But the fact is at this point, voters have a preference one way or the other. There's going to be very little new information that's going to change a voter's mind one way or the other in this last week. In fact, oftentimes we find that late breaking bits of information that, that come out are either uh, accepted or rejected by a voter as true based on where their existing impression was. Now, we saw this a uh, little bit different in 2016 when there were a number of voters who had an unfavorable impression of both uh, Trump and Clinton at the time, and there was some late-breaking news that perhaps broke some voters against Clinton. Here, we see a different dynamic at play 
we have a, a two presidential candidates, one of whom, uh, when you ask voters about job approval, how Trump did as president versus how they believe Harris is doing as a vice president, have a little bit more confidence and uh, approval of the way Trump did. At the same time, when you ask personal image of the candidates, how do you view this person individually, the voters tend to have a little bit more personal favorability towards Harris. That said, it's all going to come down, I think, ultimately for the final voters are, are they making this judgment based on their personal views and personalities, which is ultimately the argument that the Harris campaign is making, or are they going to make this decision based on how they view this person's ability to do the job as president, either reflecting back on President Trump's time versus Harris's time. That decision and the framework in which they approach the ballot box, either personal views or views about the job, that for any of those late breakers is going to be the deciding factor. And BJ, you raised a really interesting point there, which is that some um, people that you poll or that your team of pollsters poll um, don't necessarily want to tell the pollster what their voter intention is. And I'm just wondering why, why that is. I mean, what sort of reasons are there for people not wanting to tell a pollster what they're planning to do? Well, oftentimes they are inundated with calls, especially at this time of the year. Uh, they've been answering a lot of questions. They've been receiving a lot of text and mail and television. And frankly, a lot of voters are simply exhausted of being probed and prodded by individuals like myself and, and others in campaigns. But I think it takes good polling methodology to make sure you get those revealed preferences. One thing that we always do is make sure that even if someone says they are undecided, probe them a little bit on which way they might lean. And, and leaners, ultimately, those they will re begin to reveal some of that preference. You ask voters how others they know are voting. You can ask uh, them who they think might win the election. There are other ways you can ask questions in a survey to tease out where those self-described uh, undecided voters are in actuality. Um, there are, of course, seven swing states that look like they're going to decide who the winning candidate is. Um, and I just want to ask you whether, you know, you mentioned voter fatigue in in the United States. But do you think it's particularly true of the swing states where we've seen in, in some states candidates visiting, you know, 10 times or, or, or more in, in some cases uh, during the course of this campaign? Do you think w those people are particularly fatigued? And then conversely, do you think people in non-swing states feel a little bit neglected? Uh, they're not being visited quite as much. Well, that's a constant in American politics, and I think voters have grown accustomed to the level of attention that they receive. And in the swing states, I would say that there are an expectation uh, for voters to see their presidential candidates come personally to the state, to show up there personally, to demonstrate that they have a level of concern and desire to address the issues of the voters of that state. So when I talk about the fatigue, there's the process fatigue, I think, for a lot of voters. The fact that they can't turn on their televisions or watch streaming content or put their phone down for a minute because there is always another ad, political add-on or there is uh, always another text asking for those last $5 contributions or pollsters like myself reaching out to them. So there's a process fatigue that begins to set in. And voters oftentimes, I think, you, know, you find that voters who participate early uh, tend to be those who are the most locked in. They've made their decision. And by voting, oftentimes, they remove themselves from the list of target voters on both sides of the campaign. They're not, they start receiving fewer calls, fewer texts, because they've been identified as someone who's already voted. But when you look at the other states, there's a lot going on as well. They, we have all of our congressional races going on. Uh, there's a, a number of Senate races, many of them in the contested presidential states. So I don't think there's a, a feeling of neglect uh, in the other states, but certainly not the same level of intensity of contact that those in the swing states are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis and will continue through next Tuesday. Um, for people who don't want either of the two main candidates to win, uh, 
two options really. One is obviously not to vote at all. Um, another one might be to vote, for example, for uh, the Green Party candidate, uh, Jill Stein, who I believe is on about 1%, uh, according to the polls. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but what sort of a difference do you think she and that potentially all-important 1% could make to the outcome of the election? The fact is there are a number of candidates in different states third party candidates who remain on the ballot. Even Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is on the ballot in certain states. Stein is on in certain states. There are others in certain states. But absolutely, those supporting uh, those candidates are perhaps uh, legitimately supportive of those candidates, but they have no chance, obviously. And in states, these seven states that we keep talking about, where the margin is anywhere between you know one or two points on the average only between the candidates, if not a dead heat, those votes can can absolutely matter and can spoil the spoil the race for someone who they otherwise might have voted for, and can swing the results. So if the presence of these third party candidates is critically important, is going to play a role ultimately uh, in many of these places. Yeah, and I imagine that makes the job of polling all the more difficult as well. Uh, one of the polls I've just had a look at, a CNN poll, says that uh, only 30% of Americans believe that uh, Donald Trump will concede if he's defeated. Uh, what do you think about that? And when, when do you think we'll know what? Do you think we'll have a clear outcome on the 5th of November? Well, I don't think we'll have a clear outcome that night unless there is some large indications in the early states that uh, one of the candidates has taken advantage. And we'll begin to get results in places like North Carolina and Georgia, uh, North Carolina, Georgia, and Pennsylvania earlier in the evening than some of the Midwestern states like Wisconsin and Michigan. And we won't get Nevada and Arizona till later in the evening. Uh, but I do think that if there is some major shifting in those states. If one candidate or the other has a large advantage and we can call those early states, we'll know. Barring that, I don't think we'll know that evening necessarily who is going to be the president. Now, th that said, we could still see even a narrow popular vote victory can result in a large electoral victory. There are so many states that are on this knife's edge in terms of the polling right now uh, and who might have an advantage that if they all break one way, and even though it may be just by a point or two, all those electoral college votes go to that candidate and therefore could create that sort of uh, landslide effect or that idea that there is an, a large electoral college victory that cements the results uh, going into then January when we'd uh, put a new president in place. Um, one thing we've talked about a lot the last 24 hours here at Al Arabiya News uh, are the comments made by Tony uh, Hinchcliffe during a, a rally in Madison Square Garden on Sunday. Um, given that 19% of the US electorate is of Hispanic or Latino origin, I mean, obviously that's a key demographic. And I want to know uh, whether you think those comments have had a significant impact or are likely to have a significant impact on the polls going forward. And are there any other moments that have really stood out for you during this election campaign that have had uh, some significant impact one way or the other on, on, on the polls? Well, I, I think that this comment is ultimately a tempest that the media have tried to foment and create larger. It's a comedian speaking at a rally. It was not the, the candidate himself. It wasn't anyone officially on the campaign side. Ultimately, is what a comedian, a bad, in poor taste joke said, determines someone's vote for president? I don't think that this has any sort of uh, real impact on where Hispanic voters break. I mean, we have seen over time in the last couple election cycles that Hispanic voters uh, have been more drawn to Donald Trump than they have in other Republicans in the past. And it's been on a lot of the same issues uh, that have mattered to voters writ large, starting with economic concerns. But other moments in time in this election that obviously I uh, think have been important, we can't go past again the idea that uh, the Democratic Party removed their sitting president as the nominee and put the vice president in without 
her having received a single vote in a primary anywhere. That was uh, an, a, an amazing moment in our politics that happened uh, that for a long time, in much of the summer and into the early fall, had an enormous impact on where the numbers were, what voters were thinking, and how everything is going to ultimately shake out. The attempts on President Trump's life, uh, I think, were also seminal moments, uh, particularly for the Republican base uh, who rallied behind the president, uh, former president. And they've done that on a number of occasions. You even think back to the early days when uh, we were looking at the Republican primary, the almost the most important moment in time in the Republican primary for Donald Trump was the day he was first indicted. We saw Republican base voters jump six to seven points in a primary setting in support of Donald Trump because of that perceived politicization of uh, the legal system against him. And, and that almost ensured his candidacy at that point. So there have been several critical points throughout all of this, uh, this campaign, uh, but the most critical one is yet to come on, on the 5th. Indeed. And it certainly hasn't been boring. I mean, this is my last question to you, BJ. And sorry to put you on the spot here, but uh, who's your money on? My money's on Trump right now. If you look at the state-by-state uh, -state numbers, it's all within the margin. But there's a slight edge for Trump here. You've seen a little bit of shifting there. I hesitate to put too much confidence in public numbers shifting late, as we saw in 22 uh, there was this perception of a red wave building where it was just a result of bad public polls out there. So you don't really put too much confidence in that. But when I look at my numbers state by state uh, and I look at where the national numbers are here, it's a it's a difficult road for the Harris campaign, uh, I think, to go through all of those seven states. And there's some early indication today that they have already given up on North Carolina, the Harris campaign pulling some campaign dollars out of North Carolina. So essentially ceding that state to uh, Donald Trump and then taking those dollars, probably putting him into Pennsylvania or some other state that they think they still need to win. Those indicators suggest for me, if I had, um, and I don't gamble on the election, uh, but you would put the put the money on Trump right now. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed for sharing that with us, a Republican pollster and president and CEO of the Tarrants Group, BJ Martino. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Now, the Israeli parliament has voted to ban the UN's Palestinian refugee agency from operating in Israel and occupied East Jerusalem, alleging its collusion with Hamas. Well, the legislation prohibits contact between UNRWA employees and Israeli officials within three months. That'll mean restricting aid operations in Gaza and the West Bank. Well, cooperation with the Israeli military is crucial for UNRWA's aid delivery, as it is the primary UN organization in the region. Well, the US and the UK have raised serious concerns. The US State Department urging Israel to reconsider that ban, calling UNRWA irreplaceable for humanitarian aid in Gaza. Well, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says the implementation of a law banning the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency, UNRWA, from operating in Israel would, quote, have devastating consequences for Palestinian refugees in the occupied Palestinian territory, which he said is unacceptable. Well, in a statement, he said he's deeply concerned by the adoption of two laws concerning UNRWA's works there. And he added that uh, if implemented, they would likely prevent UNRWA from continuing its essential work in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. He went on to say UNRWA is the principal means by which the essential assistance is supplied to Palestinian refugees in the occupied Palestinian territory. And the implementation of the laws could have devastating consequences for them. Well, I'm joined now by Shana Lowe, communications advisor at the Norwegian, Norwegian Refugee Council. Shana, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Al Arabian News. Israel has voted to ban UNRWA, the uh, UN uh, Palestinian Refugee Agency. What's your reaction? This is bound to have catastrophic effects on the, the Palestinians living in the OPT and through in the occupied Palestinian territory and throughout the region, particularly those in Gaza 
who have now faced a year of, of hostilities, a year of Israeli bombardment, and are desperate for the, the aid that, that UNRWA and, and other humanitarian agencies are providing. Okay, just tell us what this is going to then translate into for the, the average Palestinian person, in particular, people in northern Gaza that are, uh, are really cut off at this point. Well, UNRWA is, is the backbone of the humanitarian response in Gaza. They have a huge footprint there and are able to and are responsible for much of the coordination that is happening uh, amongst humanitarian agencies. They provide fuel, for example, to humanitarian agencies so that they can go in and uh, execute their distributions. At the same time, UNRWA is providing all sorts of services that Palestinians, particularly those in Gaza, are reliant on, everything from food distributions to, uh, to the provision of, of uh, medical services, as well as educational services. Of course, schools in Gaza have been closed for the last year, as many of the schools have been converted to shelters for those who have been displaced. But UNRWA is really the, the only organization situated to help restart schools once conditions allow. That's what you're basically and saying. In terms of, it, go, go ahead. And in terms of the people in northern Gaza, very little aid at all is reaching them uh, at this point. There's there are about a hun an estimated hundred thousand people in a besieged portion of northern Gaza who are getting zero aid at the moment. So while uh, while even UNRWA is not really able to reach those people in need as soon as conditions allow, UNRWA will of course, along with other humanitarian partners, uh, be on the front lines responding to those uh, acute needs that we're that we're hearing about and 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 seeing in northern Gaza. So what you've said is that basically uh, UNRWA has a role that, you know, obviously them not being there is going to leave a huge vacuum. And it's not a vacuum that can be filled by uh, any other agency. Is that, is that basically it? That's right. They're, UNRWA is really irreplaceable at this moment. They have uh, over 70 years of history working in Gaza. They have a huge staff that is able to respond and meet the needs of people in Gaza. And no humanitarian agency, as much as they might try and scale up, will be able to fill the void that, that a loss of UNRWA would, would lead to. Um, one of the uh, Israeli lawmakers who supported the bill banning UNRWA, uh, Sharon Haskell, said Israel has the absolute right to act against UNRWA. Um, this ban doesn't come into effect, does it, for three months? And I'm just wondering whether you think perhaps in these three months uh, something might be done, something might happen to stop this, appeal this, uh, or, or reverse this decision. Well, I think world leaders need to do everything in their power to, to ensure that this bill, this law, now does not go into effect. As I said, it will have catastrophic impact on Palestinian refugees and those who have been internally displaced inside of Gaza. I think it's really important to look at this uh, at a larger scale and, and not just in terms of what happened last night with this vote, but the assault on the, the international system, on the UN system, on humanitarian agencies, and our ability to fulfill our mission, which, which is to help people who are in need. And, and we've seen obstruction after obstruction put in place by the Israeli authorities, whether it's preventing aid from entering uh, Gaza, closing crossings, or, or creating con a situation on the ground where uh, we simply do not have access to be able to reach uh, those who are in need. This is part of a bigger assault on, on humanitarian work in general and, and the UN system uh, more particularly. But can um, Israel act in this way unilaterally? I mean, legally speaking, I mean, let's talk about UNRWA. I mean, it was founded in 1949 by a UN General uh, Assembly resolution. Um, can they simply be banned, or does that decision not have to come from the UN Security Council, for example? I'm not an expert in terms of, of how UN procedures work, but I think it simply is unprecedented that we're seeing uh, a, a UN member state try to expel a, a UN body that actually, I believe it was the UN General Assembly that brought UNRWA into existence. And, and so I think that there will, that it's likely or, or potential that there could be consequences for Israel in terms of its UN membership. 
uh, because this is a dangerous precedent to set, not just in, in the occupied Palestinian territory, but globally for countries who might not like the things that the UN is doing to support migrants or refugees or people who are displaced. Uh, this, could, this could be a model that other countries that are not friendly to humanitarian agencies, that are not friendly to the UN, could, could adopt. Yeah, indeed, this language, dangerous precedent, was uh, exactly the words used by the UNRWA chief, Philippe uh, Lazzarini. Um, he called this a form of collective punishment for the Gazan people. I mean, do you think that's an accurate assessment? Absolutely. There are 1.9 million Palestinians, 90% of the population in Gaza, that are displaced. These are innocent civilians, men, women, children, the elderly, who, who have nothing to do with this armed conflict that's been that's been raging for, for over a year now. And these are the people who are going to face the consequences. The innocent civilians that have suffered unimaginably over the last year will continue to face the brunt of these political decisions. Um, let's talk about what Israel is saying. I'd like to get your opinions on this. I mean, Israel saying UNRWA has links to and has employed 190 people um, who have ties to Hamas and Islamic Jihad militants. I'm just wondering, what's the evidence for this? You know, Israel has produced very scant evidence. My understanding is that UNRWA, when, when allegations came to light, they conducted their own investigations, had independent investigations in the UN, terminated the contracts or suspended the contracts of those who were under investigation. But it simply is crazy to hold a, a, an organization responsible for the acts of its employees acting in their individual personal capacities. Can you imagine if, if uh, El Arabiya was, was to blame, if you, for example, had committed a crime? This is, this is just absurd. Yeah, I was just doing the maths. I mean, there are 30,000 uh, Palestinians working for UNRWA. Uh, they've got evidence, they say, about 190 of them. That's 0.06% of the staff body. Um, the Israeli Prime Minister's office says this isn't going to affect aid, humanitarian aid, in the Gaza Strip. He says humanitarian aid uh, must remain available in Gaza now and in the future. How is that going to happen without UNRWA, then? You know, we really don't know. There aren't really contingency plans because UNRWA has been such an important part of the humanitarian response, not just in the last year, but over the last 75 years that they've been working in Gaza. I also find it ironic that the Israeli prime minister is talking about uh, maintaining humanitarian aid in Gaza when so little aid is, is actually entering Gaza and able to reach the people. And each day we're seeing that the, that the needs are growing and growing. Yeah, I mean, another politician I wanted to draw to your attention, Boaz Bismuth, a member of Likud, and of course Likud were the architects of, of, of this bill that banned UNRWA. Um, anyone who behaves like a terrorist has no rights in Israel. UNRWA equals Hamas, period. How do you respond to that? I, I don't even know how to respond to a, a statement like this, which is so absurd when UNRWA has been providing and continues to provide humanitarian assistance and other services to those to those in need, Palestinian refugees in Gaza, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, in uh, in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. It's it's just an absurd statement. Um, let's talk about what the situation is right now in, in Gaza. Uh, today in Beit Lahia, which I believe is in the north of Gaza, 109 people reported to have been killed, uh, many of the victims displaced people. Um, what more can you tell us about the, the humanitarian situation in that particular part of Gaza? Well, the northernmost part of Gaza, which includes Beit Lahia, Beit Hanun, and Jabalia, including the Jabalia refugee camp, have been under an extremely tight siege since the start of this month. Basically, no aid is getting in and reaching those people. Water has been cut off. Uh, food has been cut off, medicine has, supplies have been cut off. And what I heard from my staff, who was just in Gaza, in northern Gaza late last week in, in Gaza City, uh, is that the, the few people that have managed, the tens of thousands of people that have managed to flee from that area are reporting extremely serious conditions where they are even afraid to flee because, because they are unsure that they will be guaranteed safe passage to, to where they need to flee to or being told to flee to. They know that there is no safety in any other part of Gaza. We've seen 
Even the unilaterally declared so-called humanitarian zone that Israel established has, is, is not immune from attack and has been targeted several times. Uh, and so the situation in the north is extremely dire and, and is really not getting enough attention in terms of the tremendous needs that are continuing to grow and the fact that humanitarians do not have access to go and meet those needs. So if no aid is getting into some of these areas, I mean, we must be very close to a situation where large numbers of people are, are going to die of starvation, aren't we? I think that's probably the case, and I think Israel has been very clear in their strategy here that they are aiming to starve people out of those areas in northern Gaza and force them to flee. They're saying that people who choose not to flee will, will likely be considered uh, combatants, and, and even if they are civilians, and, and uh, be targeted. So I think we're seeing a situation where Israel is, is using this siege to try and, and forcibly displace and, and clear out all of the people living in northern Gaza. Um, let's talk about what you'd like to see world leaders do. You said world leaders uh, must act. Um, obviously, quite a lot of world leaders have expressed grave concern. Um, who would you like to hear saying what? And, and you know, perhaps to uh, anticipate part of your answer, just for the benefit of our viewers, really, uh, the top donor states for UNRWA are the United States, Germany, the European Union, uh, Sweden, Norway, Japan, France, Saudi Arabia. Those are some of the top uh, donors. So what would you like to see perhaps those countries saying and doing? Well, first of all, those countries need to, to use all lawful measures that they can to counter this behavior from Israel, whether that's Security Council resolutions or other, other things. That's, that's up to them to decide what to do. I think there needs to be a commitment not to reallocate funds earmarked for UNRWA to other agencies, because we know that other agencies cannot fill the gap from UNRWA. And then, of course, there are the larger things that we've been asking for for a year now. The first, first and foremost is a ceasefire, a permanent sustained ceasefire, so that people can start re rebuilding their lives, start their recovery process, start the reconstruction process. One way to go about doing that is to stop transferring weapons to Israel uh, and to, to put an end to this. Uh, some of the countries I mentioned, though, uh, the US, the UK, Germany, um, are amongst the countries that back in January decided they were going to suspend their funding of UNRWA. I believe they've reinstated it. But why, why did they do that uh, back in January? Well, I believe that the U.S. has not yet reinstated the funds to UNRWA, though they have in a letter to, to that that was sent by Secretary Blinken and, and I believe Defense Secretary Austin uh, said that UNRWA must be protected and, and not banned. Uh, this was in response to the allegations that Israel made about the members of UNRWA who had participated in the atrocities on, on October 7th. Uh, many of those states have now, after UNRWA's review, reinstated those funds. And I think it's important to, to uh, for the United States in particular to resume those funds to demonstrate, not just in words but in actions, the importance of, of UNRWA uh, to the humanitarian response in Gaza. Okay, well, we're out of time now, but I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to, talk to us, Shana Lowe of the Norwegian Refugee Council. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tom. That is all we have time for on Global News Today. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for more exclusive interviews. Until then, goodbye.